I wanted to share more about my personal journey with insulin resistance and prediabetes and how I knew that I was insulin resistant. I'll be sharing some early symptoms and signs that I experienced with insulin resistance and also the symptoms of high blood sugar that I experience now. I hope that this is helpful for some of you who may be wondering like, are the things that I'm experiencing normal for somebody with prediabetes or insulin resistance? The answer is probably yes and I will get into it right now. So how did I know that something was wrong even before I got diagnosed? So let's start off with the first and only symptom of insulin resistance that I experienced before I knew what was happening to my body. Now this is a female specific symptom. So males, if you would like to just fast forward ahead, totally fine. I'll meet you on the other side. So back in my sophomore year of college, which was oof, 2000. Five? Yeah, so like oh, almost 20 years ago is when I first started noticing a shift in my menstrual cycle. So I was getting my period every like three or four months as opposed to every month and it was super concerning. So I did end up seeing a doctor who tested my hormones and found that my hormones were completely out of whack. That doctor then referred me to get an ultrasound, which I did, and they found polyps in my uterus and I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. So I was put on birth control to help regulate my hormones. And again, that was probably the earliest sign that I experienced of insulin resistance. Now, polycystic ovarian syndrome is associated with insulin resistance, but it's not clear whether insulin resistance causes PCOS or PCOS causes insulin resistance. Now, I'm not a doctor by any means, but my inkling is that my insulin resistance caused my PCOS. Now, I can't remember how long I was on birth control. It couldn't have been like more than a year tops, but my period did end up regulating even after I got off of the birth control. Then my second year out of college, which was what, 2010, so about five years later, my period started going wonky again. And this time I was also blessed with really bad like cystic acne, so, so painful. So I hopped back on birth control again for a little bit of time and things regulated again with my period and my acne disappeared. I feel like the cycle of my period going off the tracks and regulating again happened about like three or four times. I went on birth control only the first two times and each subsequent time, it took a shorter and shorter period of time for my period to regulate again without any medical intervention. My guess with that might be because I think as I got older, I did pay more attention to what I was eating and I was eating kind of less carbs, less sugar, not because I knew anything about insulin resistance at the time, but just because I kind of wanted to stay slim. But I do really think that eating less carbs and less sugar had a lot to do with my period regulating again. So that was the one and only sign of insulin resistance that I experienced prior to getting diagnosed. So fast forward to signs and symptoms of insulin resistance that I experienced after having been diagnosed. Now, if you wanna learn more about how I got diagnosed, what tests I had done, et cetera, et cetera, I talk about all of that in another video, which I will link above and also down below in the description box. That video is called, What You Wanna Know About My Insulin Resistance Journey, and you can watch all of that there. But after having been diagnosed and as my insulin resistance progressed, even into the pre-diabetic range, because I did have one A1C, come back in that pre-diabetic range of 5.9 in 2018, there were and still are signs and symptoms of insulin resistance that I experience now that are telltale signs for me when I don't have good control over my blood sugar. And the first symptom that I experience is neuropathy. Neuropathy is basically damage to your nerves, usually starting in the periphery nerves, like in your fingers or in your toes, that lead to feelings of like numbness or pain or weakness. And I remember experiencing neuropathy for the first time right after I gave birth to my first child. And this was a pregnancy where I did have gestational diabetes. So I was on a strict GD diet the entire course of my pregnancy. And after giving birth, I probably spent like, oof, like six, seven or eight months basically binging on all things sugar and carb. Basically anything that I couldn't eat while I was pregnant, I was shoveling all of that into my face. And actually none of my healthcare providers at the time told me that if you have gestational diabetes, it increases your risk of developing type two diabetes by up to 50% within the next five years. In fact, my medical providers told me that once my baby was born, I could go back to just eating whatever I wanted. So that was pretty disappointing that I didn't receive that information. And I know for a fact now that my insulin resistance has progressed so much more because of that binging that I did. 
But anyway, that's beside the point. So during that time when I was binging on sugar, that's when I first noticed the numbness that I was feeling in my fingers and in my hands, um, so much so that I was having trouble falling asleep at night. And it was always the worst at night. It was concerning enough to me that I brought it up to my primary care physician who didn't really have any answers to give me. And it wasn't until I did my own research that I realized that it was a symptom of insulin resistance and high blood sugar. So I did revisit the topic again with my doctor and I asked her, hey, could this be neuropathy? And her answer was, no, you would only experience neuropathy if your blood sugar numbers were out of control, like a diabetic range for an extended period of time, which I really feel like isn't true because as soon as I you know, started raining in the carbs and sugar, and actually after that, I decided to go really low carb keto diet for a while, like my symptoms all disappeared. I stopped experiencing any numbness in my fingers. And I haven't experienced any numbness in my hands since then. Now, every now and again, when I do eat higher carb and more sugar than my body can process, I do experience neuropathy. But interestingly now, I experience it more in my toes. So I experience like a dull aching, almost like sore feeling in my toes. And then sometimes it also reaches like a couple of my fingers, but nothing like the numbness that I experienced before. And it really does directly correlate to how much sugar and carbs I ate in regards to how achy my feet and my fingers feel and how long that feeling lasts. So that's the main symptom that I experience when I eat higher carb, higher sugar, and it really isn't pleasant. I mean, the pain is not intolerable by any means. It's more of like a dull aching, like soreness, but it is pretty unnerving that my body has such an immediate response to the flood of sugar and carbs that it can't process. And it really goes to show how much metabolic dysfunction my body is experiencing. Now, the next set of symptoms, I'm just gonna kind of lump them up into what I'm gonna call a high blood sugar episode, but it's more of an experience and this is what it looks like for me. So a racing heart, so my heart starts beating much faster and much harder, like I can feel it bumping in my chest. I get a headache pretty quickly, the neuropathy of course, and then when I think my blood sugar spikes really high, then my hands start to shake. Um, and what I think is happening with the shaking is that probably my blood sugar spiked really high and so my insulin response kind of went into overdrive and then my blood sugar is probably dropping really quickly. That's when I think I experienced the shaky hands. Oh, and I get tired, like exhausted. Like I need to take a nap right now. That actually reminds me of another symptom that I experienced, and this is specific to having a higher carb dinner or snacking late at night. Now, typically I'm not a night snacker. It's not what I do, but my husband does travel a lot for work, so I do the single parenting thing a lot, and it's in those times when I find myself either eating dinner later or snacking at night. So after a long day of taking care of the kids on my own, um, and typically I don't have dinner with my kids while I feed them because I'm trying to feed them. I'm trying to make sure they're not making a mess, throwing all their food. I'm cleaning up after them. So it's really hard to enjoy my meal. So what I typically do when I'm feeling really exhausted is I put them to bed and wait to have my dinner until they are down. And that could sometimes be as late as 8.30 or 9. So when I eat late at night, I wake up the next morning feeling absolutely trashed. Like even if I got a solid seven hours of sleep or even eight hours, I wake up feeling like I just ran a marathon, I just feel so, so tired. And this is not scientific by any means, but this is what I like kind of hypothesize is happening to my body. So because I ate so late at night, what I think is happening is basically my body is spending all night working really, really hard to try to regulate my blood sugar and bring it back down to normal. And it is just chugging, 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 chugging all night long, which is why I wake up feeling so, so tired. When you eat dinner at a regular hour, like 6 p.m., you know, you still have like three, four, you know, sometimes even five hours before you actually go to bed. And during those hours, you're moving around, you know, you're doing the dishes, you're doing chores, you know, you're playing with the kids, whatever it is, like you're helping your body burn some of that sugar with the movement that your body is experiencing. Whereas if you eat late at night and go right to bed, my body is wholly depending on the insulin response and the insulin in my body to store away all the energy versus me being able to burn off some of that glucose with movement. So again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but that's what I just imagine is happening with my body and why I wake up feeling so tired. 
Now, the last symptom and the one that I experienced the most recently and is the absolute worst out of all of the symptoms that I've named so far, and that is skin tags. I developed these a teeny tiny skin tags on my neck um, either during my second pregnancy or after I mean I didn't really notice the skin tags during my pregnancy but I mean I was probably thinking about a lot of other things but after I gave birth I noticed these really small teeny tiny skin tags on my neck now I found out that it's actually normal to develop skin tags during pregnancy because of hormonal fluctuations but skin tags are also a symptom of insulin resistance. So I think that my skin tags are a combination of the hormonal fluctuations during pregnancy and also just naturally my insulin resistance. And if anyone has a solution to get rid of them, I mean, they're really, really small, but they're on my neck and I hate them so much, please leave the solutions down in the comments below because I really wanna figure out how to get rid of them. Okay, so that's it. Those are the signs and symptoms of insulin resistance that I have experienced in the past and also the ones that I experience now. Now, I'm sure that if and when my insulin resistance progresses even further, I will be experiencing more signs and symptoms, which at that point, I'll share them with you all here. If you like this video, please go ahead and hit that like button and please subscribe so that you don't miss any upcoming videos. Thanks so much for joining me today and I will see you guys all next time. Bye.